The Holy Gospel for the fourth Sunday of Epiphany is recorded in Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Throughout his ministry, Jesus was teaching, teaching, teaching wherever he went. He would teach on the, on the road someplace and he would teach while sitting uh, on a hill or under a tree or, or, or uh, resting or even uh, at dinner. Uh, he taught in the streets of the cities. He taught in the temple in Jerusalem, but a great majority of Jesus' teaching took place, as Mark shows us here, in the synagogues of the Jews. Now, a synagogue uh, might have been a, a building on its own. It might have been uh, as, as we worshipped when I was a missionary just in the living room. Uh, a synagogue might have been a clearing uh, down by the river, as we read uh, in the book of Acts in Philippi. Here in Capernaum, it was probably its own building. And, and when Jesus was in town, this seems to have been his regular, usual pulpit. Now, synagogue church services, uh, if I can call them that, these meetings were kind of halfway between our Lutheran liturgy and our Lutheran Bible classes. Uh, uh, there was uh, a prescribed time where they gathered. There was a regular set of scripture lessons that were read from all parts of scripture. Uh, in their case, it was the Old Testament. And we still know what readings were done on what weeks today uh, because those things are marked, actually, in our Hebrew Old Testaments. There were hymns or songs and prayers that were sung according to what season of what we would call the church year uh, happened to be. And then there would be a message. And here's where things kind of diverged. Because in the synagogue, we gather that uh, it was more of a Bible class, like our lecture-style uh, Bible classes are, our larger group meetings, uh, because people would often ask questions, and it wasn't thought of as being unusual. And but what set Jesus apart from the other teachers is that he taught with authority. The people recognized this. He wasn't a preacher like the kind that they were used to, which were the scribes or the teachers of the law, as we translate here, or the other rabbis. And what set Jesus apart? Well, Jesus, first of all, of course, is divine. He is the Son of God. But also, Jesus held the Bible to be as it is, the inspired Word of God. He held it as authoritative. He didn't question it, as many did, and he didn't kind of wonder about it. He did just the opposite. He said, this is exactly what it says, and that's precisely what it means. He took it more seriously than virtually anyone had ever done. And we have the same tools and the same point of view today. We first of all acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God. He is divine. And the Bible is authoritative. It's the inspired Word of God. And so everything that we teach and, and preach and believe has its teaching firmly in Scripture itself. It is the authority we follow. Well, while Jesus was teaching on this particular day, uh, uh, somebody in the group spoke up. And as I mentioned, that itself wasn't unusual. What was strange is that this guy was possessed by a demon. 
the, the demon within him suddenly spoke up. It had entered one of the people there in Capernaum, and it asked this question, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Now, demon possession is something that, 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 that some of our members have had questions about over the years, especially if you're reading your gospel, especially, wow, you know, here in the early part of, of Matthew or Mark, uh, and there seem to be demon possessions all over the place. And, so, and, 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 and some of you have very wisely said, isn't that interesting that it's when Jesus comes on the scene that the world seems to explode with demon possessions. But notice that it continues as the gospel goes out in the book of Acts. And those early missionaries went out to different places in the world and they encountered people possessed by demons there as well. And one or two of you might know also that some of our missionaries that have gone overseas have encountered demon possessions in the cities, in the streets, in the, in, in, in the skyscrapers, in the villages, all over the place in the world. And, 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 and people often wonder, is this a sign of something? Yes, it is. And if you add up all of these details about demon possessions, and granted, there aren't very many. It's kind of like putting one, one, and one together and coming up with three. It seems that wherever the gospel is going out for the first time, the devil is there to watch and to be there, and there are these demon possessions. When Jesus first comes on the scene, when his disciples go out into other places in the world, up into Asia Minor and to Greece and, and, and beyond and, and so forth, and then when our missionaries have gone out into the world, they have encountered demon possessions because it is as if the devil uh, sends out his demons his, uh, his sort of lieutenant fallen angels as emissaries, or maybe we should say spies, to test the teaching, to see uh, if this preacher will preach, first of all, false doctrine. If it is, it's just nonsense and we don't have to do any work because why bother? And so the devil doesn't worry about it. But if the preacher is preaching the truth, then the devil has more work to do and then he's got to dig in and do something. Uh, but when, the, when, the, when, 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 when preachers and teachers and missionaries proclaim Christ crucified for our sins, we end up with targets on our back to be attacked by the devil. But we know that God has sent his, only, his holy angels to be with us and his word to remind us of the truth and to protect us. Well, here in Capernaum, this demon uh, was there. He didn't just find another one of the scribes the teachers of the law just murmuring through the same old, same old. It wasn't even an especially uh, well-read and learned rabbi who maybe was telling the people that they should be looking out for the coming Christ. Like Moses says, this demon, to his horror, found God himself. It's Je this Jesus of Nazareth is the Holy One of God. And notice that the demon only has the same tools to recognize Christ that you and I have. Because he didn't recognize him by his eye color or by his haircut or by the cut of his beard or, or by the fact that, well, he's wearing a white robe. Of course it must be Jesus. That's what all the paintings say. No, it was something very different. It wasn't the tone of his voice. It was the content of his preaching, which is exactly all that you and I have to recognize the Savior, the content of of his preaching. And so this demon uh, is shocked by this and he squeaks out, like, who is this? What, what have you got to do with us? What are you going to do? Or have you come to destroy us, Jesus? Which of course is the truth. Jesus would have nothing to do with the demon. There, there is no fellowship between God and the demons and the devil, but in fact uh, he has already destroyed them. That the, the, the devil and his fallen angels were already, this had already happened. They were ruined and, and, and thrown out by God already before Genesis 3 even starts. Because there, the devil and the other fallen angels that here in Mark were told are the demons had already rejected God, rebelled against him in heaven, were thrown out of heaven by the hand of God, and were condemned for all eternity in their prison, which God made for them, which is hell. Now, 
when Jesus is preaching, it's not this demon's turn to have the floor and to go saying something. And so it's Jesus' time to preach. The, Jesus had their ch the demons had their chance. They blew it. And so Jesus tells the demon, be silent. Come out of him. And the demon has no choice. He says no further words. He shrieks, but he says nothing else. And he comes out of the guy violently. And, and at this point, uh, as the demon, of course, has to obey, there are a couple of different things we could now talk about. And uh, the, the direction here could go. We could talk about, for example, uh, Jesus permits the demon to, to be violent with the guy one more time. Is that to show the difference between the way the devil always handles people, which is violently and to their detriment, and the way God handles us, which is always peacefully and for our good. Or we could also just notice that uh, there is an, seems to be an increase of demonic activity of the devil's fallen angels tormenting people, uh, especially in the Western Hemisphere. In North America, in, in, South, in Central America, in South America. And why is that? Well, in the Bible this happens when the gospel is brand new. And has the gospel become scarce in some places where it maybe once was preached, but now it's been gone for a long time. And now a missionary has gone, or a pastor, and now all of a sudden the gospel is new to that generation and demon possessions are, are beginning to happen once again. But, you know, the, the important thing is to notice that Jesus is fulfilling what was in our Old Testament lesson in Deuteronomy 18. Moses had said, God will send a prophet like me. Now Moses, in the text, is, is, is speaking God's word and talking about in context uh, really a series of prophets that are going to come after him beginning with Joshua, including the other ones that we mentioned with the children, these prophets chosen by God to proclaim God's word. But in the particular verses we read from Moses, he's really talking about the one prophet. He keeps saying things like prophet, singular, and him referring to the prophet, and it's the one guy. Jesus is the fulfillment of Moses' words. Jesus is the fulfillment of all of it. It's all fulfilled and wrapped up and bound up in Jesus Christ. Remember, a prophet chosen by God, speaking the word of God, and we have this office of our Savior Jesus, this threefold office, prophet, priest, what's the other one? King, excellent. Prophet, priest, and king. And as we contemplate Jesus this evening, just as prophet, he is all of these things, but we're just focusing on Jesus as prophet. We realize that we see him portrayed in this very way as the one chosen by God to speak the word of God here in the synagogue in Capernaum where he is speaking with divine authority. But he didn't just do it then. Jesus keeps on proclaiming his word today. We would say that once he did it, uh, by himself in person, uh, we might say theologically immediately, but now he works through means, immediately through the office of the preaching ministry in the church. Of course, our teachers do it with our children, our, uh, but, our, but our pastors, particularly our called pastors and, and, and to an extent our staff ministers, called to, pro to, to use the means of grace to share God's word, his gospel of forgiveness with God's people. Pastors are called uh, to, 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 to administer the sacraments, to, to baptize, to administer the Lord's Supper, to preach and teach the young, but also uh, those who are uninstructed in the truths uh, of the Bible, um, and uh, to proclaim the gospel of redemption to all mankind. And this is where, in the proclaiming of the gospel, this is where the devil attacks us. All of us. Where we have the most precious thing, the, 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 the dearest treasure God has given to each one of us personally. Something you can go home to. Some of you have one in the pew right in front of you right now. His holy word. 
translated into a language you understand. It's not just all in Latin. It's not just all back in the original Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. It's, you've got it in English. You understand what God is saying to us. And it's at that point that the devil seems to attack us the most, where Jesus is, he wants us to keep on proclaiming today, and yet the devil sows seed of a doubt, of a kind of obscene arrogance and complacency. The devil sows seeds of, of boredom. What a weapon the devil has to make us sort of yawn at the Word of God. Oh, the Bible, I've read that. Yeah, I've heard it preached. I, 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 I don't need to pay close attention today or read it at home or study it. God forbid I should continue the study of His Word because I think I'm doing my, 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 my childhood pastor an honor by saying that he taught me everything I need to know to get into heaven. Um, and so I come to church. I've kept the third commandment. But the third commandment is about the attitude of our hearts and of our minds. It's not just a thing we do to get into heaven. Nothing we do gets us into heaven. It's what Jesus did on the cross that takes us there. But this thing we do, treasuring the Word of God, yes, coming to listen to it, but also opening up our Bibles at home, this is something we do because we treasure this Word. When we love the Word of God, and especially his forgiving gospel, whatever day we do that on, we have sanctified that day as holy, that work as holy. Whether I'm sitting in church or whether I'm home doing the dishes or maybe I, I'm out driving and, and doing my job wherever it's taking me today to put bread on the table for my family because that's the means God uses to take care of us under the fifth commandment, but also other things that I do, helping my child learn his memory work, or, or, or talking to, to my friend, uh, being an open door in case they ask or want to know more about the gospel. We keep coming back to hear the word of God from the great prophet, our Savior Jesus Christ, proclaimed in the inspired word of God, preached in, in the sermon and in the hymns, and explained to us. The devil wants to plant doubt and wicked thoughts in our minds so we keep on coming back to the Bible, to keep on coming back to God's forgiveness of sins, to turn us away from our, our sinful complacency and our, our attitudes that include sort of a, a, a boredom with the Word of God. We want to hear our very prophet, Jesus Christ, and what he has to say to our hearts today. When the heart stands idle and, and, and the word of God is not heard, that's where the devil breaks in and does his damage. And before we even know what's happening, the smallest temptation uh, can become a sin that just wrecks everything. So we throw ourselves at the feet of Jesus Christ, not only begging for mercy and for his forgiveness, but like Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, to sit there to listen soak up everything our Savior is preaching and teaching and offering to us. Everything he says to guide us on our way, to calm our fears, to answer our doubts, to instruct us about our questions and about the things that maybe we've got wrong or forgotten about, and to soothe our broken hearts and our wrecked consciences, and to give us the healing Sal, the medicine of the gospel to teach us that we should fear and love God, that we do not despise preaching and his word, but regard it as holy and gladly hear and learn it. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends our understanding guards our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus.